good morning good afternoon and good evening everyone uh, thank you all for joining us today in the second meeting of trogs group uh, the robotic upper gi surgeons we have an interesting topic themed around the role of artificial intelligence ai and machine learning in robotic robotic surgery and the eventual future of the modern surgeon the meeting is titled as uh, autonomous surgery the future of surgical robotics a question that needs to be answered we have a stellar faculty today with four eminent faculty speakers two distinguished moderators and two most esteemed chairpersons it is my pleasure to introduce the first of all the chairpersons so we have uh, the first chairperson we have professor shafi ahmed uh, as most of you uh, might know him professor shafi shafi ahmed is a surgeon he is a teacher futurist innovator and an entrepreneur he is a surgeon faculty at the royal london hospital as well as the faculty of innovation and digital transformation at harvard medical school professor ahmed has been working on new technologies enhancing surgical education globally his online videos have been watched hundreds and thousands of times earning him the accolade of the most watched surgeon in the human history he aims to teach surgery and surgical processes to thousands of students at a time using vr technology his company virtual medics developed the use of wearable technology in education and clinical practice Professor Ahmed is also the co-founder of Medical Realities, a group offering surgical training products specializing in virtual reality, augmented reality, and serious games. Welcome, Doctor. Well, welcome, Professor Shafi Ahmed. Um, our another chairperson is uh, Doctor Abu, uh, Doctor uh, Adil Abu Murad. He is uh, uh, the the uh, president and the and the coordinator of the drugs. the uh, robotic uh, group of upper gi surgeons he is a general surgeon with deep interest in laparoscopic digestive and bariatric surgery he is uh, his one of the biggest fields of work is in his career is the application of robotic surgery in the upper gi uh, system uh, he is he formed the group of trogs and uh, this group this group of trogs has actually more than 250 members now and it is ever growing he is currently the consultant bariatric surgeon at regional center hospitals of orleans we have two esteemed uh, uh, moderators uh, we have dr etka graham dr etka graham is the director of the helen mcardle nursing and care research institute and an associate professor in the health services research at university of sunderland and le leads the tugs health services research group she also leads the speciality group for the health services and delivery research uh, delivery research across the national cumbria <laughs> clinical research network under national institute for health research she holds an honorary nhs contract with uh, chfst and contributes to bariatric surgery research portfolio by leading the research teams on patient experience and women's health she is also a visiting professor in the faculty of psychology at the university of uh, uh, anohok in the mexico and honorary lifetime member of the mexican college of surgery for obesity and metabolic disease uh, another uh, uh, moderator with us is uh, dr antonio albuquerque Uh, he is the consultant bariatric, bariatric surgeon at Obesity Surgical Treatment Center. He is a renowned uh, robotic uh, and bariatric surgeon and the coordinator of the Obesity Surgical Treatment Center at Saint Louis Hospital in the Lisbon, Portugal. He is also the vice president of the Portuguese Society for the Study of Obesity. He is also the vice president of SPEO, uh, an electro hybrid technological company. He is a visionary and is a huge and is hugely interested in innovations. Welcome, uh, our chairpersons and moderators. Um, uh, now, I would request Professor Shafi Ahmed to uh, give a uh, keynote speech and uh, uh, share your pulse of wisdom with us. Over to you, Prof Professor Shafi Ahmed. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me and see me. Um, uh, so, a very kind introduction. Thank you so much, and also Kamal for the. Uh, kind uh, invitation to speak at this event. So I'm going to do a little five minute talk uh, around, hopefully, uh, to inspire you a little bit further to delve deeper into the world that we're delving into quite rapidly. So look, it's an amazing time to be alive. If you think about where we are now in the kind of the exponential technologies that have been translated to clinical science and clinical practice, there's never been a better time to be alive as a surgeon. If we go back a few years, when uh, Klaus Schwab stood up at the World uh, Economic Forum in Davos back in 2015, he talked about the concept of the fourth industrial revolution. He talked about the concept of the fusion of technologies that will blur the lines between the physical, biological, digital spheres. 
I think the vertical we're talking about was, of course, the concept of digital surgery. And now we're looking at this whole kind of future vision around the metaverse. Things are changing rapidly. It's up to us to think exponentially, design processes and new treatment plans based on these new technologies. So digital surgery is a new concept. What does it mean? There's five pillars that come to mind. It's, of course, the robots that we talked about today. And 2021 is the year of the robot. We've seen the disruption with different robots coming in, more sleek and more smaller, more flexible, more cheap, more affordable. Therefore, hopefully, we'll see more of these being used across the world. We've seen enhanced visualization, high quality images now helping, supporting us navigate to a surgical procedure. We've been connected. Only two years ago, we saw the world's first operation we carried out remotely using 5G technology. And 5G is one of those key technologies that create the Internet of Medical Things and the Internet of Surgical Things to help us understand this way better. Of course, this is based around capturing key data. We know what's going to happen now, of course, with data being now uh, being much more widespread to be captured. Surgery has always been analog. We've captured data that looks at outcomes based on crude measurements of mortality or morbidity at 30 days. We've never been good at understanding the performance during an operation, the performance of the team using ethnography. Can we use that data in a bigger way and perhaps create a command center to have all the data in real time relayed onto a dashboard during an operation? And of course, it's going to be enhanced instrumentation, the five pillars of digital surgery. If we look at the technologies that can underpin all of this, we call it the convergence. So what do we think about? It's not just about AI on its own and deep machine learning and robotics, it's 5G. It's the immersive technology, AR, VR, and mixed reality, creating extended reality. It's the avatars, the holograms, remote collaboration. It's nanobite technology. It's genomics to allow us to create personalized medicine, wearable sensors. So for surgeons in the future is how do all of these converge to create a better experience for surgeons and better outcomes for our patients? Can we be more personalized in our approach? Can we expand? Can we teach remotely? What we're seeing now, of course, is telemedicine escalate over the last two years because of the COVID pandemic. Telesurgery is now coming in, telemonitoring, teleproctoring, with the real-time remote collaborations from around the world, we can train people or perform operations in a remote place. The, democra the democratization of surgery is almost afoot with us. We all have an ambition. We can improve our own lives, of course, and the practice we have. But the big ambition of this society is how do we now improve the lives of many people around the world? Think one to many rather than one to one. How do your skills now can be relayed across the world? I remember doing the world's first Google Glass operation in 2014, the world's first virtual reality operation in 2016, and then using social media to push out learning around the world, sharing knowledge, sharing what we do around the world, being more transparent and open, using data for all of us to enhance our own performance. So I'll leave you the final statement. A quote by William Gibson, who's an American Canadian author, who talks about the concept of the future. And he also coined the term cyberspace. What it describes, of course, is the term that the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. And what we're seeing with these wonderful conferences put together by the team here is bring that together so the community here can support that vision and, and spread the word of technology innovation so for all of us to redesign clinical trials, to redesign rapid ways of deployment, to train the future surgeons that are more digital in their nature. So hopefully by the end of this session today, we can create kind of linear thinkers to become more exponential thinkers, to redesign, reimagine the future of surgery. So enjoy the conference. It's a great program. Well done, all of you. And I'll be here for a short bit just to see how it's going. But, but the future is very bright. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shah, to Professor Shafi Ahmed. Uh, over to the moderators now as they will uh, take the conference further from here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to this fantastic meeting. Uh, and we'd um, 
it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you in this uh, with such a, um, a very nice group of uh, experts in this field. Um, I will be start presenting the first speaker, um, Dr. Tanya Trianta Filu, I believe I'm saying correctly. Um, Dr. Tanya is an upper uh, GI surgeon, currently appointed uh, as a post CCSD fellow in the UGI surgery at Hippocratian General uh, Hospital of Athens, uh, which is uh, uh, affiliated to the University of Athens. She has over eight years of experience in esophageal and gastric surgery, and she has received extensively training uh, in upper GI surgeries uh, from high volume centers such as in Japan, Stockholm, Rotterdam, and she's an expert to, um, she's, she's expected to start a, a year UGI fellowship in Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, in the beginning of 2022, I believe. Um, she's as well a published author of uh, regular key publishes on topics related to upper GI, bariatric and hepatobiliary surgeries. And she's an upper GI surgeon from Greece with exceptional interest in novel technology. Um, with no more delays, she will bring us a topic which is the impact of artificial intelligence in robotic surgery. Um, as we all know, the robotic surgery has been widely incorporated in the surgical practice um, to enhance uh, a convenient and flexible approach for the surgeon. And the advances of um, uh, AI, the artificial intelligence, may have the potential to assist the surgeon uh, by encountering repetitive movements um, to controlling the maneuvers to increase accuracy um, and further improve the perioperative uh, and oncology in the future. Uh, so the floor is yours, Tanya. Let's uh, look at you in your presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good afternoon to you all, and thanks for the kind introduction. Please allow me to share my screen now. Uh, it's a great pleasure being here with you. And of course, I want to thank the organizing committee for the kind invitation and all the effort they put to make it happen. So today I'm supporting the title of the impact of AI on robotic general surgery. And therefore I'll try to uh, transfer to you the current landscape of the topic as a young surgeon rather than an AI expert. So to begin with, uh, machine learning, which is basically an unknown to the general surgeon term, um, seems to be the way to go. Computer, computer systems being taught several human functions in order to achieve tasks and troubleshooting is the initial learning process. And uh, machine learning has the potential to become autonomous, otherwise also known as unsupervised, challenging the relationship between the surgeon and the patient. Now, these steps can nowadays be applicable in general surgery in a both preoperative and perioperative setting. Regarding the preoperative planning, enrolling data sets has enabled accurate diagnosis, decision making, classifications, imaging, even staging of malignancies through incorporation of algorithms in endoscopy, pathology, and radiology. Today, we hold validated scoring tools and prognostic tools to classify diseases and even predict the response to treatment using patient-related data in the ICU, the elective, or even the emergency um, setting. For example, identifying a patient with a possible diagnosis of appendicitis that will benefit the most from a probable surgical intervention seems to be crucial. Similarly, using algorithms based on uh, the patient characteristics upon arrival in the emergency department enhances triage in the emergency department. Um, Furthermore, we can see, we can now even predict the postoperative outcome in terms of morbidity and mortality, taking into consideration the vital signs of a patient during the surgery. 
or even predict the actual uh, operation time in several surgical fields, as you can see in this table here. We can even predict the hospital stay after a surgical operation, taking into consideration the, um, uh, the particular uh, duration of each phase of the surgery. And um, the question now is how can actually AI affect um, the execution of a complex um, surgical task? And where do we stand today? Well, the fact is that um, we do not really uh, need to replace the surgeon's role, but rather to uh, eliminate the human errors. And these errors may be due to lack of attention, due to technical uh, mistakes, or even due to uh, improper recognition of anatomy during the surgical procedure that may lead to um, significant adverse events. And this is the most important aspect of the impact of AI. Um, the rationale is not to diminish the surgeon's role. Um, although the robot enhances stability and precise articulation of the surgical movements, fatigue, tremor, increased haptic pressure cannot be 100% accurate. This is the probable impact of AI, a machine that learns to think, to see, and act without errors, a completely trained robot that will be the key regardless of the complexity of the mission. And this may reflect advances in the, in, uh, the camera location, the mapping of the area of interest, navigation and tracking between um, the different tissues. And let's go to this very important application of AI. The training of a young surgeon, as you all know, is along a challenging way of observation and constant modifications by the supervisor based on the trainee's performance. Obtaining direct haptic feedback from the console through sensors that can assess future breakouts or the quality of the knot can become a breakthrough in surgical training and providing direct feedback from the console can improve the maneuvers and skills, especially among novices. As you can see here, simple surgical tasks may benefit from direct feedback from the sensors. But can actually computers outperform humans in the OR? Well, among the first attempts, the STAR experiment demonstrated the completion of suturing and anastomosing X and in vivo in animal models. And the goal was actually to compare the outcomes of the human and the robotic performance using visual assessment of the simple tasks, such as using the diathermy. Uh, and this was the first experiment here to complete um, this circle using diathermy. And this picture here gives us a clear image of how precise the autonomous drive was compared to the manual approach. However, when blood clots were present, as you can see in the first two uh, graphs here, um, you can see that the autonomous drive had a bit, uh, a little bit problem recognizing the change of the map uh, compared to the manual way. And this actually underlines the constant need for supervised um, and a shared control strategy instead of um, uh, having a, an absence of the uh, control by humans. And I know this is a completely chaotic slide here, but it's just to give you an idea of the superiority of the STAR approach compared to the laparoscopic and robotic approaches uh, in terms of uh, suturing, uh, spacing, uh, leak pressure, number of uh, mistakes, and the total completion time. And you can see that both in vivo and ex vivo, the STAR technique was proven to be superior. And let's go to the surgical stuff. Um, one of the most appealing aspects of AI in upper GI surgery is the acceleration of early diagnosis, whereas healthcare quality assessment definitely benefits from the ability to predict the prognosis of an oncologic patient. But now, technically speaking, using AI models to safely navigate and dissect during a gastrectomy, let's say, 
has been recently described. Mastering prediction and guiding of safe dissection planes was analyzed by expert surgeons who answered quality assessment questions on the performance of the applied AI model, which was able to recognize loose connective tissue fibers and guide dissection, as you can see in this picture here. The same experimental approach has been implemented in the identification of the vast deference during hernioplasty, as shown here, and during holocystectomy as well, to confirm the location of the cystic duct and to avoid any type of injuries. And during laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, for example, as a step towards completing data input of the surgical steps, and during colorectal surgery to create the initial data set of the surgical phases, the instruments that are uh, mandatory during the procedure and to document all the maneuvers the surgeon has to perform. And this is a kind of an electronic, a digital, let's say map of the whole operation. And this is the initial phase of the data input before um, trying to apply it in an autonomous way. And here we stand today, speaking about robotic scrub nurses, the, the so-called Penelope nurse, um, a, a Greek name, I guess, is now able to recognize voice commands and gestures. That's why it's also known as the gesture nurse, aiming to minimize the distraction in the OR, to eliminate the noise and the lack of communication, and therefore reduce the operation time. Finally, intelligent digital operating environments shall include intelligent light settings, automatic uh, temperature modifications, the position of the surgical table, um, the tilt of the camera, the function of the insufflators, or even the suction. And we can now even speak about automatic docking of the robotic systems, all of these aiming to um, uh, reduce the operation time. And another interesting um, aspect, it was really impressive uh, for me, uh, to my eyes as a general surgeon, we can now even imagine a robotic procedure in an astronaut via remote control from planet Earth, a picture that could only be science fiction in the past before the idea of human control telemedicine had been incorporated. But where do we actually stand today in terms of real incorporation of AI in real life surgery? Well, one of the latest meetings, the Delphi Consensus, states that there is currently a lack of guidelines on the users, usage of um, AI um, in surgery. Therefore, this driveless model has shown gradually here diminishing the role of the doctor or the surgeon is unlikely to, to be established anytime soon. Besides, the goal of implementation of AI in surgery today is to complement rather than replace the teacher, the mentor, the surgeon, the nursing staff in the OR. And in fact, autonomous AI in surgery still remains experimental and realizing its limitations is the initial step to maintain patient safety. So I, I really want to thank you all for your attention. I'll just stop sharing, sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Dr. Tanya. Um, it was a fantastic lecture. Um, I believe that we are going to proceed with uh, the other presentations and the presenting of the other, um, the next uh, speaker. Uh, I, will, I will give the, uh, the speech to Dr. Itki Graham. Um, and later on, we will discuss all the lectures uh, on yet. That's great. Thank you very much. And again, thank you, Dr. Tanya, for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, really, really so much to think about and reflect on. And, and thank you so much. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Alexander Azengart. Dr. Azengart is an assistant professor in the Davison 
Division of Gastrointestinal Surgery at the University of Florida in Gainesville. He's completed subspecialty training in advanced laparoscopic, metabolic, and bariatric surgery. He also served as a Lieutenant Commander in the US Navy Corps. Dr. Eisengart's clinical interests include bariatric, anti-reflux, and gastroesophageal cancer surgery. He has research interests in the mechanisms of metabolic and weight loss surgery, novel techniques in the management of foregut conditions, and global health and access to surgery. The title of his presentation is Ethics of Artif Artificial Intelligence in Surgery. Welcome, Dr. Alexander. Thank you, Dr. Graham. That's a very nice presentation or uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. And again, thank you for Dr. Singal for organizing this meeting. It's been um, a lot of work and he's done an excellent job with um, putting together a, an esteemed panel of excellent um, presenters. And I truly thank you all for joining us today. Um, let me share my screen and we can take off on this talk. Let's see. All right. All right, so I hope you all can see my screen. And again, I appreciate the invitation to participate in this conference in this meeting today. Um, it's been my pleasure to listen to the previous conversation and, or presentation, and I hope to add a little bit more to the topic of especially ethics and legal implications of robotic surgery. Um, so again, as uh, Dr. Graham has mentioned, my name is Alex Eisengard. I'm a um, robotic slash laparoscopic surgeon. I do mostly foregut and bariatric work. Um, and I do have quite a bit of interest in development of robotic technology because most of my um, current clinical practice is in the robotic in the robotic field. I have no disclosures except for the fact that I am a consultant and an instructor for the Intuitive Company, which is at least in the United States, is the biggest robotic provider for technology to the surgeons. And um, I am aware of the fact that they're actually working on some of the aspects of artificial intelligence in order to advance the current systems and hopefully add more capabilities to us for the robotic surgeons who perform um, minimally advanced techniques. So let me set the stage as far as where the artificial intelligence overall has started and then how it got involved in the field of medicine and then especially in the field of surgery and then more importantly, I'll discuss some of the ethical as well as legal implications of robotic surgery, um, especially when, it, when we're dealing with autonomous robotic machines. So the evolution of artificial intelligence uh, started in the 1950s with Alan Turing, who everybody knows, created the whole um, test of artificial intelligence being confused by human intelligence. And of course, the research has sped up over the last 20 to 30 years, and you know, we really didn't approach the concept of artificial intelligence in medicine or surgery until we actually started developing machine learning and more specifically, as you can see on the right, deep learning, which is basically ability of artificial intelligence to form brain-like structures that are very complex, very um, integrated, and as a matter of fact, very difficult to understand for human engineers. So the other two things that went into this um, were natural language processing and computer vision, as the previous speaker has mentioned. So the natural language processing is the ability of the computer or the artificial intelligence system to actually handle and understand human language with all of its nuances, all of its abbreviations, and more specifically understanding the medical language that a lot of the physicians and surgeons use around the world um, in order to describe conditions, patients, symptoms, as well as possibly complications and the operations themselves. Um, computer vision is the ability of the artificial intelligence system process and understand the pictures as well as the videos that are being input into the computer system. Um, and as a matter of fact, there's a lot of debate ongoing in the surgical community, at least in the United States, as far as who is allowed to have access to all of these videos um, and all of these pictures that are currently being recorded around the country and around the globe. Um, and a lot of it are actually being compiled and stored by both the robotic companies such as Intuitive, as well as by the data companies such as Google, etc. cetera. So um, to back up a little bit, you know, the true interest in artificial intelligence and the robotic surgery started 
in the military, at least in the United States. It started with the um, advanced research program in the US military called DARPA. And they've put in a decent amount of money in order to develop a robotic surgeons who are capable of actually going out into the field, going out into the combat zone and performing surgery on both the you know, um, service members, so both the soldiers as well as the enemy combatants in order to stabilize them in the field and then bring them back to the field hospital without subjecting surgeons or physicians to the danger of being exposed to violence. You know, and this is the current interest in the military as well. And this is part of the reason why they continue to support the field because it will be a game changer as far as providing um, trauma care in the field, especially trauma care in an area that is exceptionally dangerous for humans to get into. Um, but as a matter of fact, this will change the framework for accountability as far as who will be um, held accountable for the care of the both the wounded soldier as well as the potential enemy combatant if the care is provided by the autonomous system. And this is the question we'll look into in a few more minutes um, as my talk continues to go along. So currently, um, if you can look at this transition picture, this is actually borrowed from uh, Verb Surgical, which is the company that Google was working on in order to create um, a disruptive technology in surgical robotics. And the slide has shown the phases of development of the field of surgery since the time um, immemorial, basically since the beginning of surgical field um, to the current point where we are at this point right now. Um, you know, obviously the open surgery is still practiced, laparoscopic surgery is still practiced, but we can see that the laparoscopic surgery development and the skill acquisition has leveled off. And now, as you'll notice, um, we are in the initial stages of the robotic surgery where we are slowly and then eventually rapidly will be increasing the, both the skill um, acquisition or the skill, skill foundation as well as the technology itself in order to push us to the final, hopefully final frontier, which is the digital surgery, also known as artificial intelligence surgery. And that's where we're heading to, which again, at the same time um, is exciting, but also very scary because it does bring up a number of ethical and legal uh, questions, which I'll address in a minute. So the questions as such, you know, so let's imagine we're all at the point where we have created an autonomous surgical robot and we have a system available. So what's next? You know, who is responsible for the actions of the robot, um, especially since the robot cannot understand the blame, the sanctions, the accountability, liability, culpability. Um, will the patients trust the autonomous robotic surgeons? You know, will the patients be able to go into the hospital feeling happy about the decision they've made and you know, lay down on the table and have a completely autonomous system with no feelings and no thoughts operating them. And then more importantly, what happens when the robotic system is hacked or it's compromised in some way, especially its sensory mechanical interface, and then it actually commits a mistake or commits an error? Um, that's a very tough question, which is unfortunately not being covered by my talk today, but again, something we can look into in the future. So let's review, before we get any further, let's review the principles in the medical ethics. You know, so the first four um, quite well known to us, you know, stemming back from the days of Hippocrates, you know, you got the, obviously the do no harm, not maleficence, you got the beneficence, you know, so the intent to promote good for the patient, you got the autonomy of the patient, which is a respect for the patient's right to self-determinate, um, determine, and then of course you have justice, which means you have to treat the patients equally and fairly um, no matter what. Now, I added additional two components to this, which is trust. It's the trust in your surgeon as well as trust in the artificial intelligence system um, in privacy. You know, privacy especially is a very hot topic now um, in the days of you know, a lot of data being gathered by the com companies around us without us even knowing that. So, um, the definition of trust in artificial intelligence is very different than when you're dealing with a human surgeon and a patient, you know. So for any of us, especially for a patient to be able to trust the artificial intelligence system, these five things have to be taken into account. You know, the system has to be transparent. So the operations have, they pretty much have to be visible to the user. 
Now, visible to the user doesn't mean that they have to be understood by the user. You know, a lot of us don't really understand what the advanced robotic systems do and how they do it. But at the same time, we have to know what the machinations and what the um, the reasons behind this work, you know, are. You know, the robotic system has to be credible, so the outcomes have to be acceptable, and they have to be, um, you know, of the value of the quality that we deem to be. Um, high or the, to be acceptable by us, there has to be, you know, auditability, which is basically, it has to be measured and reproduced. It has to be reliability. So the AI system has to perform as intended and has to perform as intended over and over again. And then, you know, probably more important is recoverability, which a lot of us who practice robotic surgery no, that's um, and you know keep it in the back of our mind every time we do these operations. The robotic system, there has to be a manual control that can be resumed immediately if there is something that's going wrong. So with the current robotic systems, obviously <clears throat> we're in full control of the technology, but at the same time, if there is a mistake or if something happened, there is an ability of us to emergently undock the robot and then resume the operation in a either laparoscopic or an open fashion. Um, and that brings us to a more important topic of responsibility. So responsibility is defined by three different factors. As you can see, there is accountability, liability, and culpability. And I'll go through each of them a little more in depth in the next few slides. So accountability is the capacity of a system to give an explanation of its actions. You know, humans, especially the human engineers, need to understand the decision behind the autonomous robotic action. And more importantly, if something went wrong, why that happened. Liability, liability is uh, in relation to who's at fault, right? So liability currently is defined that the robots, even if they're autonomous, cannot be liable for their actions, you know? But what if in the future, the robots who are capable of, or that are capable of learning new things can actually cause damage that's not the result of their programming? That's one of the questions we'll look into in a few minutes. And culpability, culpability is basically giving out punishment. So culpability is assuming that you're guilty and you have to be punished and who will be punished in this situation. Of course, the guilt and punishment are linked to the notion of free will and conscious. And um, currently the robots cannot be punished since they have no civil liberties. So let's look at all of this in a little more detail. So accountability, as I've mentioned earlier, um, you know, it's a very tough topic. So complex deep learning systems can make unfair and discriminatory decisions. They can develop bias, they can become unexpectedly dangerous and potentially form and create dangerous behaviors. You know, and this has happened already um, in some of the rudimentary experiments that both Google, Facebook and other companies have performed where they um, using either, you know, image recognition or facial recognition software or some of the language software and when left on its own, a lot of the, especially the image recognition software turned and became racist, for example, you know, so we have seen this happen already where the robot is left unchecked or not the robot, but artificial intelligence system is left unchecked and there is no accountability. So um, one thing that the researchers have realized, it's important to implement a system to record the input, the internal state and the output of the robotic system, artificial intelligence system, to ensure that it's always transparent and accountable. And that's the only way we can understand and appreciate why these systems behave the way they do and potentially start behaving in a way that's not anticipated by the designers. Um, liability, and again, that's who is liable for mistakes that are being created. You know, currently, like I've mentioned, um, the robot is not at fault. So the damage caused by the surgical robot done today is automatically attributed to or imputed to the, uh, the manufacturer of the robot, the operator or the surgeon of the robot, and the person who potentially is responsible for the maintenance of the robot, which is usually the company that's created it. Um, but not the robot itself, right? Even though autonomous robotic systems are capable of learning new things and they're capable of adapting to their environment, um, especially the newer generation of the robotic systems that we're anticipating will be coming out. So what happens if they cause damage that's not the result of their programming? You know, who is at fault? Is it the company that at fault? Is it the, is it the surgeon who's sitting in the room and watching the, the robot operate? Because at that point, we'll have no input into the ability of the robotic system to 
do the operation. Well, so there is a lot of debate about whether the bad behavior of the truly autonomous system is truly unpredictable. So basically, <clears throat> if you look at it this way, the artificial intelligence system, especially the autonomous robotic system, will be able to learn things on its own. Obviously, that's a whole definition of autonomous um, artificial intelligence. However, all of the learning will be designed within the framework specified by the engineer, specified by the company who designed it. You know, robotic surgeon, even if it's an autonomous robotic surgeon, is not going to decide one day to become a poet or become a firefighter. You know, that's not going to be capable within its software. Um, at the same time, the robotic architecture, so the whole mechanical structure of the robotic surgeon will place physical limitations on the tasks that the robot can do, right? So a robotic surgeon is purely designed to perform surgery, you know, and it will not be able to go out and play golf. So if the robotic system does something unpredictable, if there is a break in its programming and if, you know, it starts doing terrible things to the patient, is it truly an autonomous thinking device that's, you know, doing something um, on its own without any liability by the designer of this company? So that's a tough question. And at this point, people are thinking that the, the designer, the engineer of the robotic system, even if it is an artificial intelligence autonomous system, will still be at fault for any mistake done by that system itself. And then of course, culpability, that's again, that's the guilt and the punishment. Um, you know, if you look at the current judicial system, a person is guilty of a punishable act if one, if either one, they perform an intentional act that's freely chosen and leads to damage to somebody, or two, if they have not taken the trouble to avoid the act, and again, it leads to um, damage to a person or a thing. Um, so now, currently, the AI program cannot be found guilty of its acts because it has neither free will nor conscious, nor has any freedom in any sense that we can potentially perceive, you know. Um, and that's probably going to stay this way because I don't think artificial intelligence or autonomous robots will ever develop free will and conscious, you know, unless you, of course, a big fan of science fiction like I am. So um, in the event of the robot, the robotic surgeon performing an infraction or a mistake um, in a current judicial system, and as far as we can see into the future, only human can be considered criminal, criminally responsible and likely either the operator of the system or the assistant of the system or the designer engineer will be found guilty and punished for whatever the mistakes that the robotic systems perform. Um, so as far as the ethics is concerned, again, it's a very tough question and a lot has been done to look into this um, and a lot more will have to be done as far as we can tell because, you know, based on the way the technology is developing, we can't predict everything that's going to happen in the near future. But the ethical considerations currently are being driven by the fear of autonomous robotic systems or autonomous artificial intelligence systems harming the human physical and mental integrity and then reducing human autonomy, basically making us into their slaves, right? So um, this, there have to be a distinction between, especially when we're dealing with surgical robots that are potentially becoming autonomous, you know, when the patients or other surgeons are looking into this, you'll have to make a, um, Basically, you'll have to differentiate between the robot being a mechanical amplifying man manipulator, being just a tool that's doing its job, or is it truly a moral agent, which is given the, um, by the patient is given the capabilities more so than it actually possesses, right? Meaning if a people pl placing more trust into it and they attributing a lot more to the robotic system that it truly um, should be um, because of the fact that we're, placing unrealistic expectations on the autonomous robotic system. So um, in 2020, the United States Department of Defense has approved and has sort of um, uh, pioneered the five aspects, as you see in this picture, of the ethics in the autonomous artificial intelligence systems. And this translates to the surgical artificial intelligence systems as well, you know. So they have to be responsible, they have to be reliable, equitable, governable, meaning controllable, and then traceable, meaning transparent. And I believe both in the military aspect, in the civilian aspect, in the medical aspect, all of these five um, 
principles have to come into play when dealing with ethics in autonomous artificial intelligence systems that are particularly designed to perform medical and surgical tasks. I highly recommend uh, taking a look at this article. It came out a few years ago, and you know some of my presentation is actually based on that. Um, but they do go over in much greater detail than I have, um, you know, about the legal regulation, ethical framework for specifically developing standards in autonomous robotic surgery. And of course, again, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to all of you. Hopefully. Um, you guys have lots of questions and we can have a great discussion and you know, I'm hoping to get to them at the end of this presentation, but if not, feel free to email me. I'm always happy to chat with my colleagues from around the world. And again, thank you uh, for giving me this chance to speak with you and I'll stop sharing now. Dr. Alex, thank you so much. I, I was absolutely riveted by, by your talk. Um, you know, a lot of sort of ethical and moral considerations, you know, culpa and liability, just thank you for you know, raising awareness and just really giving us that proverbial food for thought with this. Um, Dr. Dr. An Antonio, can I pass it on to you to introduce the next speaker, please? Well, um, my compliments also to the doctor. Um, we will discuss and um, it's my pleasure to to present the the next uh, the next uh, speaker, um, Dr. Sonal Astana. Uh, Dr. Sonal is the lead consultant and senior consultant of hepatobiliary and multi-organ transplant surgeon uh, at Aster Integrated Liver Team Carol Team in India. Uh, is one of the most eminent names in the field of hepatobiliary surgery in India, and besides, is an innovator and a visionary. He is also the director uh, of um, an hepatobiliary tissue engineering uh, at Pandorum Technology, which is a tissue engineering and regenerative medicine company. And Dr. Astana is um, a trained hepatobiliary and transplant surgeon with work experience in leading centers such as in North America, UK, uh, and he has completed uh, an, America, um, an American Society of Transplant Surgeons uh, accredited fellowship at the University of Alberta Hospital uh, in Canada, and is also uh, author of more than 35 peer-reviewed papers um, and has won international awards for basic and clinical research. Um, is going to um, present us the digital augmented intelligence in hepatobiliary surgeries, if it's a doorway to complete autonomy. Uh, as we all know, uh, hepatobiliary surgeries are some of the most uh, complicated abdominal procedures, requiring uh, much uh, precision and skill base. And in tradition of, of uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, to these minimally visible approaches uh, of this kind of surgeries um, of various levels of difficulty, such ranging from the simple cholecystectomy to the complex hepatobiliary resections, has many promises in the future as we are going to see. Thank you. And the floor is yours, Dr. Sanal. Thank you so much for Professor Abhikai for this uh, very kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Saurabh, for this uh, uh, for this sort of uh, introduction to the this wonderful community. I must say that I've thoroughly enjoyed the last two talks because uh, I've I've learned immensely. Uh, as uh, uh, the you know as already said, I I, I am a hepatobiliary and a multi organ transplant surgeon. That's my day job and that's what I uh, do for a living. Apart from that, uh, I'm also an adjunct professor at the Indian Institute of Science, uh, where I have an opportunity to work with uh, some of the finer AI ML minds in the country. Uh, and I'm also fortunate enough to work in Bangalore, which is probably uh, next to Silicon Valley when it comes to startup action. So there are a lot of interesting people to, to work with and a lot of ideas to, uh, to sort of consider, uh, which is perhaps why uh, sort of thought that I'd be the right man for this job. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, 
so that's actually my disclosure slide. Uh, I think I'm going to take uh, uh, this moment to say that it's extremely very difficult to predict how the future is going to unfold, but it is probably safe to say that it will be very different from what we're doing right now. Next slide, please. So broadly speaking, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, this topic in the following heads. We'll talk about how hepatobiliary surgery has actually evolved to where it has. Where, where are we at right now when it comes to AI ML adoption? And uh, where are the specific heads where we think that uh, AI uh, can actually augment our decision making or perhaps even replace it and move towards complete autonomy in the future? Next slide, please. So, uh, if you are to divide the era of hepatobiliary surgery for the vast majority of its evolution, it's been a bloody and a messy affair. Uh, you know, hepatobiliary surgery 1.0 uh, is refers to surgery in, of the liver, say, before the 1970s. Uh, the first partial hepatectomy was done in 1886, and the patient died six hours later because of bleeding. Uh, the Japanese was perhaps the... Uh, yeah, please stay there. Yeah, thank you. The Japanese were perhaps the next to do right hepatectomies, uh, and uh, it wasn't until 1949 where a hepatectomy, as we currently define it, was actually performed. Obviously, the Pringle procedure helped immensely. It was uh, designed for trauma and is currently also still used for, uh, for inflow control. So what tools did the surgeons have at their disposal right now? If you look at the right side, uh, we knew that there was a glissonian pedicle. We knew that there were a lower anatomy, of a right lobe and a left lobe. Cautery was relatively primitive. We did not have adequate muscle relaxation and regional anesthesia for the large part of it. And uh, at least in the early part, blood transfusion was just coming into work. And this reflected in uh, you know, the outcomes that were reported. Uh, so till the mid seventies, you had a resection rate of approximately uh, 9% and a mortality rate of about 30% at about one month. So clearly this was not a surgery that one would want to be doing for oneself or for one's relatives if one could help it. Uh, next slide, please. So when we move on to the next bit of it, uh, we have the an adoption of the segmental anatomy, which was actually dis, uh, discovered by, or discovered in Makunad in 1957 and further refined by Makuchi in 1989. Uh, Fobal lobectomy became the standard of care. And this actually, uh, you know, accelerated significantly because when living donor liver transplant was considered and a part of the liver could be transplanted into somebody else. So there was obviously this pushing of the safe limits of extent of liver resection. We benefited from new technologies such as interoperative ultrasound uh, and dynamic imaging uh, as listed below. Uh, there were advances in anesthesia critical care, which perhaps saved the lives of very many. And uh, we were also able to push the board out a little bit when it came to two-stage resection, which was also described by Professor Makuchi in the early part. The next slide, please. Yeah, and this is, uh, uh, I mean, a criteria that is broadly used even today, in which we try to combine the quality of the liver and the extent of resection and try to find a safe medium uh, to offer curative resection to many. Next slide, please. This is currently the era of hepatobiliary surgery that we're living in. Uh, this started from about 2000 onwards, uh, where we currently have moved away from segmental low lower resections to parenchyma preserving surgery, minimally invasive surgery, which was started in 1991, uh, vascular reconstruction. And this is also uh, related to the fact that transplant and HPV go together these days. And uh, so a lot of uh, vascular reconstruction, which was available uh, the technology which was available to liver transplant surgeons is used for complex HPV surgeons as well. Indications are expanding as we continue to push the boat out using ALPS. Uh, we are obviously aided greatly by accurate CT and MRI, which has uh, expanded immensely in the last two years. So, uh, you know, right, right from sort of faster and more accurate CTs as well as MRIs uh, to, uh, for better localization. We also have 3D simulation and navigation technology Interoperative imaging has changed a lot using especially uh, ICG and uh, VR and AR has made a limited appearance. And this is uh, definitely uh, reflected even among the cases that are being 
done right now, as you can see in the lo lower uh, left corner. So 4,095 uh, laparoscopic resections, uh, a lot, large number of them were subsegmentectomies, which were uh, parenchyma preserving, and the 90-day mortality has fallen to less than 1%. Uh, so clearly, there's been a huge improvement in what we can offer in terms of care. Next slide, please. So where will the revolution begin? I think it's safe to say that it would begin in visualizing and planning a resection. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, trying to fit in uh, what we know about the tumor with whether it is oncologically appropriate, what is the condition of the patient, and the quality of the liver. Next slide again. Uh, we know about the segmental anatomy, and uh, I think the biggest challenge that we face in both training and in terms of orientation is how do we convert the imaging as we know it right now and convert it to this 3D image in our head about where a tumor will be and how close it will be to our blood vessels. Next slide again. <clears throat> this is how we've learned our anatomy. Now it's a cross-sectional representation of arteries, veins, and vessels in the liver. Next slide again. And based on where uh, where the uh, where the sort of uh, uh, sections are, we are able to infer whether people uh, whether tumors are which segment of the liver we are dealing with. Uh, next slide, please. So essentially, a large part of surgical training is trying to work with this two dimensional cross section and trying to position into into a three dimensional. A place. And this is a large part of surgical training as well, because this is not intuitive. This is something that we have to train ourselves to do. And this is something that we now do as a second nature, but, uh, and certainly this is one of the more difficult parts to pass on to trainees. So there is no way of, you know, juxtaposing what is seen on a CT scan to a 3D image directly. Uh, so this is probably uh, the sweet spot or, or the sore point, the pain point where actually, uh, you know, planning can make a difference. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, and this is probably more of the same thing, uh, where we try to map out our segments based on, uh, uh, you know, the uh, location, the anatomical location of either the veins or the portal vein. Next slide again. Yeah, so, uh, and we have obviously taken it further. Now we can do a lot of uh, software-based reconstruction. And apart from that, we can also uh, control congestion volumes. So we know how much damage or how much percentage of the liver will be affected when we take out a portion of the liver, as well as uh, the amounts that may be affected if we, uh, you know, interfere with the inflow or the outflow of that segment. This kind of information does help immensely when we are planning both a resection or a transplant. Next slide again. And of course, the next step here is making a 3D model. This was uh, done by an uh, SRZN in 2013, uh, where a model was printed used uh, using you know, CAD images or STL images uh, generated from a CD scan, uh, where we could actually localize the vessels as well as the, the tumor. Next slide, please. Uh, the same thing can be done for the biliary tree, and you can actually decide on uh, biliary anatomy, especially when the anatomy is thought to be anomalous. This can really help in deciding where a resection can be performed. Next slide, please. And uh, from a transplant perspective, uh, this is particularly useful in planning really small grafts for children where we can measure the volume of the liver that needs to be resected, uh, the volume that the child needs, and plan any preoperative reduction procedures in advance. Uh, this was reported in Japan in 2016. And next slide, please. And this is something that we have uh, done in our unit as well. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Karthik Rajurkar, has presented this paper as well uh, when we actually created a 3D model. And what I'm holding here is basically a 3D model of the vascular tree of a liver that's been printed out. We use the left lateral segment here to actually, uh, uh, you know, for, for a child, and we use this to plan a transplant uh, for, for, for a, pediatric, a pediatric recipient. Next slide, please. So uh, clearly, the difference is going to be in the spatial correctness, uh, converting 2D to 3D, uh, which is something that uh, uh, we can help with in imaging guidance. The problem is that there is 
there's definitely a lag in between the CT images and uh, uh, the surgical thing. And the best way there would be to uh, get Im intra-op image acquisition, which can take a long time. So uh, basically, the better way is to work uh, through through mixed reality, uh, which is probably, uh, although it may be imperfect, but it is as close as you can get. Next slide, please. And this is certainly what colleagues in Oslo have done using VR and liver resection planning. Uh, if you can play the video, please. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so again, uh, as you can see, you can actually uh, see this using your VR glasses. Planar tumor, you can see that it's very, very close to uh, you know the posterior part of the portal vein. Uh, so this allows you to visualize this uh, as one is operating and even superimpose uh, the CT scan image onto a real uh, onto the operative field. The next slide, please. So currently, this is where we are at. Uh, we have moved from, uh, you know, the planning of a computer tomographic model to a 3D model, which is a 3D printed and a virtual reality model. Uh, this is something that we have just shown you in the last few slides. This is something that has already happened that is currently being practiced in many centers across the world. The next slide. And going forward, what we would like to see happen is uh, also using this technology for intraoperative planning, where we are able to combine these modalities, 3D modeling, CT scans, VR, and, IC, uh, and using ICG, so that we can actually plan out tumor resections or segmental sparing resections uh, real time when we actually merge all this data with what we actually see in the intraoperative field. Next slide, please. And this actually lends itself very, very well to laparoscopic and robotic resections because uh, you can incorporate imaging into the workflow. You can superimpose imaging on your visual field. Uh, it also helps with, uh, uh, with spatial orientation. Uh, you know, of course, this has been shown in smaller studies that it helps to define the transnectional plane, saves blood, uh, reduces the time of surgery. Uh, and uh, th th this is uh, but larger studies are needed. Next slide again. Uh, robotic resections make it a lot easier. As you know, uh, the biggest, one of the biggest advantages for me for robotic resection is the amount of magnification that you get. Uh, dexterity is much better. I think uh, uh, now robots have advanced to the point that basic knot tying and suturing can be done. As Dr. Tani has mentioned, you can actually have a robotic assistant relatively soon, uh, uh, which uh, will be able to tie knots for you. Okay. Uh, AR visualization for tumor-specific port placement has been also tried and been shown to be effective as well. I guess the big difference here is the loss of haptic control. That is something that still needs to be uh, factored into, uh, you know, or into technology uh, because that that is currently still a drawback. Next slide, please. And this is uh, where it's very very useful. Uh, this slide is from Matthew Hunt. Uh, you know, where we actually see a tumor in segment eight close to uh, the uh, ventral part of uh, the portal vein and uh, imparting the middle hepatic vein. So you can actually superimpose the location of the middle hepatic vein uh, based on imaging onto your robotic field, uh, which actually helps you uh, navigate around it while you're operating and, uh, the, and uh, allows you to do a very small resection, a segment eight resection without damaging any blood vessels. And this is an interesting area where you can actually combine these two. Next slide again. Of course, the pitfalls are, uh, you know, there is a time lag. Uh, you know, you do need to acquire better images. Haptics are still a problem. And this, of course, is a problem that there's too much information to a surgeon to deal with. I think, uh, would you, uh, you're getting this huge amount of new information uh, and uh, processing it is going to be a, a very big challenge. We have to find new ways of working with it. Next slide again, please. Um, now, we have actually shown that, uh, I mean, many studies have actually shown that using uh, uh, AI-based uh, imaging decision-making in pre-operative planning has shorter, uh, shorter operating times, better oncology outcomes, uh, uh, safer resections, lower blood, supply, blood usage, et cetera, shorter operations. And uh, there, there is a, there's a good amount of work that has been done by colleagues in Birmingham. Next slide. 
uh, one of the interesting and the tantalizing things here is that we can actually combine it with, uh, with technology that is currently coming out because uh, tumor margins is often a challenge when you're not able to feel a tumor margin. So you can actually uh, look at the effluent that is coming out from your energy devices and uh, analyze it for bi biomarkers with mass spectrometry. Uh, this can actually help us uh, decide on whether you are on a uh, you have a safe margin or not. Uh, if you have AIBS real time analyte evolution of uh, of this uh, effluent, it can be incorporated in the well flow uh, into the workflow. So basically, you have you know imaging, you have uh, an energy source, you have overlay of imaging, as well as analysis of the margins that happen that's happening real time using a uh, you know, uh, real-time mass spectrometry of the effluent that's coming out. The radiomics is another field that's going to use. There's a massive amount of radiological data. Uh, this can allow for deep learning for both the quality of the liver as well as the tumor. Next slide again. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, where big data really comes into, into its own, uh, where we can assess not just the liver quality, the margins, vasculature, and I think the first thing is I would reiterate is that automated reporting workflows are likely to happen relatively soon. Next slide again, please. Uh, Post-operative outcome, I'm just going to skip this slide because Dr. Tanya already talked about it. Uh, you know, when it comes to uh, presenting post-operative outcomes, uh, the, uh, you can actually have patient-derived organoids and AI-based uh, chemotherapeutic trials to identify optimal chemotherapy combinations for people. This is again, something that is being done at the NUS uh, right now in an experimental fashion. Next slide again. Uh, again, this is sort of the million dollar question. Will AI replace judgment? Uh, again, next slide, please. So come to a question that we face a lot. Suppose there is a patient who's cirrhotic for whom both uh, resection and transplant are possible. Uh, we, we struggle with this discussion every day and it involves a lot of surgical and non-surgical uh, factors that we consider. So certainly it's complicated for the best of us. Uh, would, would say an AI system make that judgment. Next slide again. Uh, again, I mean, this is just good to go through that. Of course, you can have good tumors and good livers and bad tumors and bad livers and a combination of everything in between. And certainly a lot of your decisions will be made on the tumor, the liver quality, as well as the affordability and the net benefit to the patient. Next slide. Uh, we'll just skip this one because it's a reiteration of what I just said. Thank you. So what's going to change in the pre-operative imaging? I think AI-based workflows will appear relatively soon. They have surgical training. It will make a very big difference. Intraoperative AR and VR. Uh, is already in use at this point. Uh, I think we will see AI uh, used to guide and drop decision-making relatively soon. Uh, when it comes to treatment decisions, I suspect that we will take some time. Uh, if I was to use analogies, we would say that uh, machine learning is uh, probably analogous to resident training. Uh, experience is more analogous to deep, deep learning. Uh, so th that's something that we will need. Next slide again, please. Uh, hepatobiliary surgery 4.0 is likely to involve machines in the form. Next slide again. But I do hope that uh, overloads are going to be friendlier. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sonal. Um... Well, um, it's excellent talk uh, in such a complex um, surgery as hepatobiliary surgery is. Um, we will uh, have the discussion uh, by the end um, and I will pass the, the talk to Dr. Itka for the, the presenting of the next speaker and last speaker of this wonderful meeting. Thank you very much, Dr. Antonio. And again, I think just to reiterate what you said, this is such a complex topic, and I really have to congratulate all the speakers for presenting the information and, and just breaking it down and, and really giving us things to think about and, and helping us to really understand and 
unpicking the complexity. So, so thank you to all of you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Tyler Loftus is the Assistant Professor in Acute Care Surgery at the University of Florida. He is also the Assistant Program Direct, Associate Program Director of General Surgery and currently pursuing a PhD in Biomedical Informatics. He has a lot of interest and experience in the field of artificial intelligence and machine learning. The title of his presentation is The Future of AI in Surgery. Welcome very much, Dr. Dr. Tyler. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Uh, I must confess, actually, during the last presentation, I lost power uh, to my computer. And so I've, I've joined now by phone as well as on my computer. Uh, so I've got my video up on my phone. Can you hear me OK on the computer? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, can you enable a screen sharing, please? Okay, can you all see my screen? Excellent. Okay, uh, well, again, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Tyler Loftus. I'm a trauma surgeon at the University of Florida. Uh, thank you to TROGS for the honor of presenting at this session. Uh, I'll be discussing the future of artificial intelligence and surgery. Uh, and this will include applications ranging from robotic platforms, as we discussed uh, earlier, as well as some uses of artificial intelligence algorithms in preoperative and postoperative phases of care. Uh, so currently, there is a substantial gap between the development of artificial intelligence models and the ultimate goal of clinical implementation that improves surgical care. Uh, this gap has been referred to as a valley of death in which artificial intelligence models succumb to mistrust driven by lack of transparency, as well as indifference to low utility predictions and classifications that are already addressed uh, by standard clinical knowledge and expertise as well as time constraints that are imposed by manual data entry requirements and lack of integration with uh, clinical workflows. It may be possible to overcome uh, model mistrust by establishing high model accuracy while maintaining transparency regarding associations between input features and the model's output. Uh, transparency is especially challenging for deep learning algorithms and there are black box functions uh, as some of the speakers before me discussed. Uh, one emerging solution is to generate uncertainty estimations. Uh, which are described on this slide. Uh, so the idea here is that um, a model that makes correct predictions uh, about 90% of the time is performing well. And folks may actually wonder if uh, any given prediction is uh, one of, among the 90% that are correct or among the 10% that are incorrect. Uh, and for predictions on future events, uh, it's impossible to know that in advance. So instead, uh, what we wonder is if the model can tell us its certainty that the output is among those that are correct. And some emerging evidence suggests that this is possible by making a series of slight modifications to the model's architecture. Uh, basically, you generate a series of predictions with various architectures by dropping out certain neurons in the network. And then you get a distribution of predictions and you can measure the variance across that distribution. And that gives you an indication of the model's certainty uh, or the likelihood that any given prediction will be among an outlier that is one of the rare uh, but egregious errors that deep learning algorithms are infamous for. Um, uh, learning curves are sort of a separate um, uh, topic that I'll just gloss over for the sake of time. Uh, next, I'd say the challenge of low utility predictions being ignored could be addressed by targeting risk-sensitive risk decisions for which the balance between risks and benefits of competing treatment decisions uh, are either closely matched or unclear, rather than something that we already do a good job of making those decisions or performing those tasks. And finally, artificial intelligence models of the future could save clinicians time by gathering data and generating calculations using automated digital workflows that integrate seamlessly with clinical workflows. Uh, ultimately, these approaches have the potential to bridge the gap between um, model development and improved surgical care. Uh, pragmatically, this could be accomplished by building artificial intelligence applications that fulfill six criteria. Uh, algorithms of the future, uh, I would propose, should be dynamic, precise, autonomous, fair, and reproducible. And, and some of these elements have been discussed uh, by my colleagues in earlier talks, but I'll address each of them individually in this talk as well. 
So first, explainable algorithms convey the relative importance of input features in determining uh, model outputs. Uh, patients, clinicians, and investigators often want to know how algorithm predictions are made. For example, an algorithm predicting a post-operative complication could identify the most important risk factors for that complication. Uh, this approach has the potential to improve the clinical utility uh, by identifying modifiable risk factors, like for blood glucose control and ongoing tobacco use, as risk factors for wound complications. Uh, this suggests a role for explainable algorithms in um, surgical prehabilitation to mitigate risk factors for complications. Uh, the next desiderata is um, uh, algorithms being dynamic, which means that they capture temporal changes in uh, physiologic signals and clinical events by time series modeling or sequence modeling. Uh, similarly, uh, precise algorithms use data collection rates that are proportional to the rates of physiologic changes, uh, which in our case would, would usually uh, pertain to vital sign changes. So an example of this is the deep SOFA model uh, that was published in scientific reports. This captures uh, temporal vital sign trends to predict in-hospital mortality. And uh, as you can see, the predictions made by the deep learning algorithm are um, much more accurate than the traditional SOFA score. Um, predictions. And it also identifies escalating risk for mortality at earlier time points, which could uh, allow for earlier therapeutic intervention. Uh, next, autonomous algorithms train and execute with minimal human inputs. And this sense of autonomy is something that was uh, addressed in the previous talk by, by Dr. Isengard and carries some important ethical considerations that I'll gloss over here for the sake of time. Uh, but an important part of automaticity is that manual data entry requirements impose time constraints, and this hinders clinical application. So for dynamic models that capture temporal changes by frequently resampling high-resolution data, the cost of manual data entry is even greater. Uh, fortunately, the widespread availability of high-volume electronic health record data promotes algorithm autonomy by providing a vast source of routinely collected clinical data for millions of patients annually. Uh, with the right infrastructure, this high volume data can feed algorithms autonomously in real time. Uh, the next desiderata is uh, fairness. Um, fair algorithms evaluate and mitigate implicit bias and social inequity. Uh, in theory, algorithms use mathematical formulas and functions to produce objective outputs, um, and this can serve as a bulwark against uh, bias and inequity. But in practice, many algorithms are trained on unbalanced source data, and they produce biased outputs when they're applied to an underrepresented uh, population uh, or patients that wasn't really represented in the AI algorithm's training data set. For example, if a decision support tool incorporates the observation that Black patients have increased risk for mortality after coronary artery bypass, then the model outputs could decrease the probability that Black patients will undergo and garner the benefits of an indicated procedure. And this is gaining some attention from the uh, society of Thoracic Surgeons and, and their risk calculator. Uh, so although artificial intelligence applications have the potential to worsen bias and inequities, if they're applied properly, they could also help in terms of bulwark against bias and inequities by promoting objective decision-making rather than standard hypothetical deductive reasoning, which can unmask implicit or unintended bias uh, from cognitive shortcuts that clinicians are sometimes forced to use uh, when they're making high-stakes decisions under time constraints. Uh, reproducible algorithms are validated both externally and prospectively, and they're shared with academic communities. In a, a survey that was distributed by Nature uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, more than 70% of all researchers had attempted and failed to reproduce another scientist's experiments, and 90% uh, thought that science is facing a reproducibility crisis. Uh, and reproducibility is, is even perhaps more important for algorithms, um, and it's actually rarely attained. Uh, to ensure that algorithms are suitable for external validation, uh, I propose that results from interventions using artificial intelligence algorithms should be reported in a standardized fashion, uh, which is proposed by the Spirit AI and Consort AI guidelines. And in addition, generalizability uh, of AI algorithms to other practice settings uh, can be enhanced by using input features that are collected routinely in clinical care while well, excluding features that are, whose collection requires specialized measurement tools that aren't available in all settings, uh, because the model obviously wouldn't be able to generalize to those settings. Uh, this is going to look very similar to a slide that Dr. Eisengard presented, um, and it's because I think it's, it's actually quite an important theme, these classic S-shaped curves. 
Uh, so like other um, innovations, artificial intelligence and surgery follows classic S-shaped curves that have three phases. Uh, first, the introduction of a new technology, uh, then the achievement of a performance advantage relative to existing standards. And third, the arrival at a performance plateau, which is followed by a replacement with a new innovation. Uh, minimally invasive surgery innovations have, have illustrated this pattern. Uh, for select operations, surgeons have achieved better patient outcomes by transitioning from rigid endoscopy to laparoscopic and then robotic surgery. And it remains possible that semi-autonomous and uh, micro-robots will advance, uh, provide performance advantages for some procedural tasks in the future. Uh, for example, uh, researchers at MIT developed a biodegradable origami-like robot uh, that folds into an ingestible pill, and then it unfolds in the body and moves by redistributing its weight uh, when activated by external magnets. In a silicone model of the human foregut uh, with a battery embedded in the stomach wall, the robot dislodged the battery and patched the defect in approximately five minutes. Uh, more complex tasks and greater autonomy are currently beyond the reach of simple combinations of sensors and actuators that uh, typify contemporary surgical robots. Uh, but as technologies improve, micro robots might gain real-time environment sensing and more effective autonomous locomotion, which would be necessary to perform complex tasks uh, like suturing and targeted drug delivery. Already deep learning based computer vision applications and kinematic analyses on intraoperative and simulation based video allow models to learn anatomic structures, instruments, and suturing motions, uh, as presented in earlier talks. And these algorithms can associate those elements with clinically relevant outcomes like technical complications. And those associations could be used to inform technical skill assessments and coaching to facilitate technical performance improvement. Uh, so artificial intelligence innovations in surgery feature progressively greater machine autonomy in place of human influence, uh, but uh, currently there's no level one evidence demonstrating that artificial intelligence applications improve patient outcomes compared with existing standards for performing operations or surgical decision making tasks. Uh, the caveat is that there is level one evidence produced for a perioperative blood pressure control tool. Uh, this is um, a visual abstract from a randomized trial in which an artificial intelligence model using waveform data to predict hypotension uh, prompted anesthesiologists to act sooner, more often, and differently, uh, resulting in fewer hypotensive episodes and less time-weighted hypotension. Uh, therefore, current surgical care is minimally influenced by artificial intelligence. Uh, as applications improve over time, uh, this influence is poised to increase Automation of programmable tasks might allow surgeons to spend less time gathering and analyzing data and more time interacting with patients and tending to urgent, critical, and potentially more valuable aspects of patient care. Uh, yet, artificial intelligence is incapable of the important human traits of creativity, altruism, moral deliberation, and emotional intelligence. And it's unlikely that artificial intelligence will ever play a dominant role in surgical care. The surgeon's role may evolve to interpreting artificial intelligence enabled decision support systems to offer wisdom for patients and caregivers who are facing complex high stakes decisions and uh, semi autonomous surgical instruments and robotic platforms in the operating room that remain under the surgeon's control. And uh, right now, at least, that is essential for ethical reasons, uh, as presented by Dr. Eisenberg. Uh, I would propose that surgeons should assume active roles in guiding these technologies towards optimal patient care and net social benefit. Uh, if we advocate this role, then it will uh, inevitably be performed by others. Uh, we have briefly reviewed some important concepts and work regarding artificial intelligence and surgery. Uh, for a more comprehensive review, I would suggest uh, the articles that are listed here. Uh, thank you all for your time and attention, and, and thank you again to TROGS for the honor of presenting uh, at the session. Uh, I'm going to sign off my computer link and uh, leave my phone on so that I have a video and audio both. Thank you very much, Dr. Tyler, for an ab again a an absolutely brilliant and, and thought provoking um, presentation. We are we're really truly grateful, and I I'm so sorry it's so stressful when 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 IT goes down. But you know, well well done. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, so that is the um, that is the, the final speaker for this session, and um, I, I would like to hand it over to the the chairs, please. Hello, everyone. So I, I thank everyone for this uh, great topics.
um, medicine and science are universal bounds that commit us to serve with the best of our knowledge uh, and uh, the finest of our skills. Artificial intelligence may be the evolution of surgical procedures, but the human touch and interaction are irreplaceable, especially in surgery. Machine can do better through specific technical aspect, but whatever performance it can get, the aim is still and always be the well-being of humanity. So we must never lose from sight that the goal is not to replace, but to help and serve human beings. Dear all, it's a real pleasure to see our group so active and alive. It's our second meeting and the enthusiasm is growing. It's as always a renewed pleasure to attend and enjoy such excellent topics given generously by such distinguished experts and colleagues. At first, we came here a gathering of strangers from different cultures, countries, and nations. We have one purpose and the goal, which are to exchange and experiences by cheering, cheering of our scientific point of view and to help each other where it's needed. I hope we live as friends, sisters, and brothers bound by our will to help. We should never be strangers from now on. I am happy to know every and each one of you. I thank Zorab Singh for the organization of this high quality meeting. I want also to thank Alessandro Martini, the, the guy in the open and the shadow giving a precious help in many ways. And finally, I have a thought for our friend Ali, who has not been able to join. I'm confident to assure him of, on our behalf, our friendship and deep sympathy in such difficult times. Again, many thanks for our distinguished guests, speakers, moderators, organizers, and to all the attendees. And as we say in France, amitié à tous et au revoir. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, special thanks to the chairs, uh, the moderators, all the speakers, and uh, uh, Dr. Mahavar for giving us the opportunity, everyone the opportunity to be a part of TUGS. And uh, special thanks to Alessandro, who has been there uh, all throughout the, the preparation for this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, all the audience as well.